there's an awful lot of people here that I know very well. <coughs> just, before, <laughs> just before I start, perhaps a, a couple of quick comments because there are some very special people in the room and people that I've been involved with. My involvement with aviation started, I suppose, with my folks. Uh, I had two uncles and my dad who were all uh, flying in Blenheim's C-47s and even mosquitoes for a while. A um, few special people that really got me involved. Um, the person who got me hooked originally was uh, Jeff James, uh, the late Jeff James. Organised a ride when I joined the Air Training Corps and uh, I went for a ride in the HRFU, a Cessna 175 that I'm quite sure a few folks would remember. He was the, uh, the first flight man, but the bloke who, uh, he perhaps got me nibbling on the hook, but the bloke who set the hook well and truly was none other than Malcolm Yeo. Uh, both my lifelong friend Murray Corf and I have been thrown out of Perth and Maylands more times than I like to remember. Uh, Murray and I flew with Malcolm on many occasions and uh, were it not illegal, I, I might mention that we got some right-hand seat time, but somebody from the department might listen. Um, it's one of the worst kept secrets around, isn't it? How much right-hand seat time people get, both given and received, all highly illegal. Um, I had a lot of fun with Mal in 172s, 182s and chipmunks, and uh, that was really great fun for me. People who taught me officially are here, Harry Smelders, I don't know whether Harry's here today, but uh, I remember so clearly in his wonderful Dutch accent we came in to land on 1-2 in a little 150 and it was gusting and blowing. First time I'd ever flown an aeroplane when it was pretty blowy and I can still hear him in his lovely Dutch accent. He says, you got to take charge of these things, Dicky. they'll kill you, you know. <laughs> and Kerry Lovegrove, who spent a lot of time patiently trying to batter things into my skull, and I haven't killed myself, so I must have done some good. People around in the Aero Club, Dave Kleeman, for the very generous flying in his aeroplane and uh, storing some bits and pieces of this little project in his hangar. Um, so many people have been generous with their time and experience. The late Teddy Rear christened our little Friday group the Lunch Whopper. And people like Peter Yates, Ian Gonsal, Graham Hartree, Jan and Andy, Neil and Teddy Rear, very, very generous with their, uh, with their time and advice. Some of the people who've just showered me with all sorts of information since I've started this. Jan Endy, great friend, lovely bloke. Um, Johnny Jansen and Johnny Brown, thank you so much for your help as well. Even here, right up the back there is a gentleman by the name of Ken Wiggins. And when I was an apprentice, Ken was the, the person who spent a great deal of time in the Department of Civil Aviation battering uh, good workshop practices through my thick head. Uh, folks, I am so grateful. I will be grateful to you for the rest of my days. I'm in your debt. So here was the deal. Like a lot of people who didn't have enough money, uh, I wanted an aeroplane. So Murray and I tossed around what we were going to do. That's the Sonics, and it's a little aeroplane made no, none other than Oshkosh in Wisconsin. That's where the factory is. And that was taken at Oshkosh. That's the little blade. So when you want an aircraft, you do have to go through a bit of a process. What sort of aeroplane do you want? Well, yeah, one of those would be nice. <laughs> but seriously, uh, and the comment was put to me, you couldn't even afford the oil for that one, let alone the fuel. To say nothing of how much it would cost to actually put it in the air. But gee, aren't they nice to look at? <laughs> so what about one of these? Well, the RV <laughs> series, Richard Van Grunson makes these home-built kits. It's an interesting 
uh, statistic that that breed of aeroplanes is now the most produced aeroplane in the world, is the RV series. Can't buy one made, got to build it yourself. But he ships more kits than anybody else. Great design, but there's the little comment. We looked at this one and thought, mm, engine looks a bit expensive. My good friend Dave Kleeman put an engine in his 182 and uh, there was about enough money to buy a can of Coke out of 50 grand. So we looked at that and decided, no, we, we, we couldn't do that. So we came across this little boat. This is the Sonex. But my mate Jane Andy said, if you buy one of those things with a veto, if it doesn't kill you, I will. But I won't have to because it probably will. <laughs> so I'm allowed to buy one of them. So, well, this one had a standard tail. How do we get on with that? Uh, yeah, I've always been a bit of a chicken. I really do have a tail wheel endorsement. But the only reason I did it was to shut Neil Rear up. <laughs> so what about a nose wheel? Well, there it is. And so this is the one we came across. Volkswagen-based engine. There's an option of Jabiru, but without wishing to sound un-Australian, didn't like them very much. But that was the little thing that we decided on. So, okay, where do we go to from there? Can you get to fly one? Well, actually we could. The gentleman, uh, sort of semi-standing, is the owner of that one, and that's in Yarrawonga in Victoria. A gentleman by the name of Stuart Trist, who is the president of Sonics Owners Association in Australia. Uh, I, incidentally, I'm not into being a great pioneer. There would be about 1,200 of these little fellas flying around in their various guises. One of my great boasts to people when they say, have you flown one of these? And I say, oh yeah, I've flown one from Victoria all the way into New South Wales and back again. Yarrawonga's on the border. I flew it across the lake and back. <laughs> It flies a lot like a little Avector sports star. Nice little aeroplane to fly. So Murray, Murray and I thought, yeah, we can build one of them. So off we went. So do you buy one or build one? Well, <laughs> you really have to want to build one. This was just the bucket list, you know. I'd like to build an aeroplane. So we did. And why the Sonex? It's a well-known company in the kit. 1,200 or so of them are flying. That was a couple of years ago, over 1,000 flying at that stage. It's now top 1,200. It's affordable. Well, you know, affordable is what you make it. People who own a P51, they say, oh, geez, you could afford a twin-engine turbine Cessna. But me, yeah, this was affordable. Volkswagen engine, affordable. I actually did the costing on it. It's got a thousand hours TBO, and I'm an apprentice motor mechanic. Thank you, Mr. Wiggins. And uh, I went through all of that, and now I'm a qualified motor mechanic, as well as a TAFE lecturer and a retired person, which is kind of important. I costed that out. I can overhaul the Volkswagen engine for about $800 my kind of engine. And good feedback from the builders. They're all keen. They love the thing. What do you buy? There are some people, a bit like tailwheel pilots, who say the only way to build an aeroplane is from scratch. To those people I'd say, well you didn't mine the aluminium ore and you didn't make the aluminium. So it's just a question of whereabouts you fit in. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I could see that being a very, very lengthy process. So, buy some of the plans, uh, sorry, buy some of the parts and build the rest with the plans. Buy as many of the manufactured parts as you can and you can build the rest. And there is even a quick build kit now. It wasn't available at the time. I might have considered that. So there's preparation. Now when you're going to prepare for building one of these things, the first thing you've got to do 
is my peace with she who must be obeyed. This is possible. You're probably right. I said to the Royal Aeronautical Society blokes, and it's the same story here, I said to Marg, do you want to come down and listen to me speak? And she said, now get, let me get this right. For three quarters of an hour, you're going to prattle on about aeroplanes. Why would I want to come down and listen to some more of that? <laughs> so anyway, she's... I'm just searching for a word. Comfortable is not right. Okay is almost right. Um, accepting is probably the best word of the ultimate abuse of the patio. Tolerant. Tolerant is good. Almost, anyway. Resigned. That's resigned is a good word. My good friend John Pittman, not only is he a TAFE lecturer in the automotive area, but he is a very enthusiastic and exceedingly capable carpenter. This is the construction of the building table. And that's a marvellous work of art and absolutely dead flat, which is an important part of it. You need mates like that. Yeah, that didn't come out quite as well as I hoped it would. 25 mil of chipboard on the top of it, and it's absolutely perfect. Got a few chips and dings and a bit of green paint on it these days, but uh, you'll see where that's come from. <coughs> little bit of weatherproofing, just in case the wind happens to come in from the north and blow the rain in on the project, the plastic gets thrown across the whole thing. It's an interesting one. Colin Morrow, who's from the Sport Aircraft Association, said to me the first time he came out, this is the ideal place to build your plane. I said, geez, I'd like a hangar. And he said, yeah, but if you had a hangar, you have to get in your car and drive down there, and it takes you three quarters of an hour. He said, this way, if you've got a couple of hours, go outside, do something. And he's right. This is the ideal place. I just wish I had a really big shed out the back. Another of John's projects is the grinder and now the bandsaw and the drill. Bits and pieces there for the operation. The table showing the plans. Plans are really, really big. I've forgotten what A size it is, but that's about oh, five and a bit feet across. Very, very handy. Lives inside. You've got to organise yourself so that this was part of the organisation. You're going to get some big boxes with lots and lots of bits. There's no point in putting bits everywhere because after you have, you've got to be able to find them. So all of those little cupboards and what have you, they're all labelled and numbered. In the back shed, that's just general storage behind, but they're the other bits and pieces. In fact, I didn't quite get it right. I needed more long storage, not quite as much small shelf storage. And there's a Sonex. It turns up just like that. So I called the crew, Murray, David, my brother and myself, we got out the drill, undid the box and packed, unpacked 16 boxes and numerous other bits and pieces. That was a separate box. That's the main spar. I should say the main spar is in two pieces and that's us unloading there. Very interesting that each time you undo another box you think, geez, I wonder where these go. <laughs> but it was kind of exciting. We were sure that it would all come good in the, in the end, and it has. So there's a couple of the crew taking a short break before we push them back into work again. And you can see all the cardboard boxes. And that's how the aeroplane arrives. Lots of boxes. And I know both John's wife and my wife said, it doesn't look like an aeroplane. How can you make an aeroplane out of that? I didn't listen to them. You've got to organise yourself there, the spreadsheets that I organised, and they just nominate where every part goes. I haven't lost many bits so far. Every now and then you have to put some, something somewhere careful. That's the aeroplane's windscreen, and there was the little note I put it because it was in the middle of the lounge room carpeted floor. Please don't step on the aeroplane's windscreen. Um, 
Margaret said to me, I won't step on the aeroplane's windscreen for today, but if it's there tomorrow, I will step on it. That lives down in Dave's hangar. Car. There's inevitably some bits and pieces that they didn't send you with the kit because they were out of stock, some that you forgot. So you have to do a big inventory, and that consumed, I suppose, about 30 hours. When we finished, there were the various bits and pieces that came from Sonics, the makeup bits. I might add that when I did the entire inventory, there was one nut that we couldn't locate. I actually wrote to Aircraft Spruce and said, you owe me one nut, and they actually sent it to me in an envelope. <laughs> Whole heap of tools that came from a place called the Yard Store in Kansas. You, uh, you tend to do a bit of shopping on the net. Uh, bear in mind, this was the time when our dollar was actually a little bit better than the American, so that was really nice. Although the, the cost of freight is a little bit nasty. Finally, after you've finished all of that stuff, the building starts. Now, I'm a motor mech, so I'm a bit of a workshop manual person. Guess what? There isn't one of them. What you've got is a plan that looks like that. And it says, down here, you need those bits. And some of the bits say, build out of this little bit of channel. So it becomes a steep learning curve. You build a part to specifications, you ally it to a drawing, you write something on it, and you move on to the next bit. That was a, I, that was a pretty special moment. Hey, these were the first two aeroplane parts that I'd ever made, so that was fun. Murray at this stage was also cutting and drilling and filing and um, getting most things right. <laughs> and me too, I might add. We'll deal with things that went wrong in a moment. Uh, what they would do is they give you something like that that was flat and say, bend this at that point to a 30 degree angle. How? <laughs> Just says bend it. So you go on the net and have a look at the Sonex people and there are various people that have done things successfully, some that haven't, and uh, you learn. John said, why don't we set up a piece of wood, blah, 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 blah. Wonderful idea. And there it was. There's the bent part. Worked out very, very well. Thank you. Tar. So then you get to start putting things together. And there's note, the, all the little notes to self inside of the bend. Because it's really important and it's amazingly easy to make a mess. The first rivet is set. You can see the, the happy little bod setting his first aircraft rivet. I might add that I left a part out and we had to drill it out anyway, so <laughs> I just show the picture, but yeah. Murray's rivet, however, worked out very, very well. It's still there and is destined to fly, we hope. There's the part, all nicely primed up and ready to go after a few little corrections here, there and everywhere. So, I have up the front here some of these little blokes here, a thing called a Cleco, and, or Cleco, depending on which school you went to, and at best we describe it as a temporary rivet. So, if you feel so inclined, you want to have a little look, uh, you can have a look afterwards. You might see some of them up the top of the tail there, just holding the, the tip, the fiberglass tip on, because later on we'll take that off and paint it. Okay. Here's what you have to produce. What you've got to do is you've got to produce a shape like that. Now it was only after I'd done the first one that I found if you got a big sheet of brown paper, put it on the table, drew the plan out, that worked a whole lot better. Nobody had actually suggested that, so I took credit for that myself, looked it up and other people had already done it. <laughs> There's the skin that's got to go on there. How do you wrap a skin around? Amazingly easy. You go down to super cheap autos or Bunnings, you buy yourself some of those ratchet cargo straps. Attach it on one side and just pull it over into place. It does work very, very well. And again, if you're onto a builder's site, 
fortunately, all the people sort of share their little ideas. I also go to this man over here and say, Brownie, how do I do this? He's full of ideas. One of the things that I had to do was find out how you can rivet right up next to something. So I got my very cheap rivet gun, ground the side off it. Man, it still works very well. <laughs> Might break one day, but that's all right. It only cost about 10 bucks. Bunnings do very well out of builders. There it is with that range of Clecos on it. To make things a bit easier for you, some of you might be able to see the lines of rivets. All of these parts here are pre-drilled on the skin, but they don't go into pre-drilled holes. You have to wrap the skin around and then drill the holes. Needless to say, if you wrap the skin around and you look through the holes and there's not a rib there, you didn't get it right. Start again. There was the <coughs> elevator. So the elevator is, in actual fact, pretty well exactly the same as the, uh, the rudder. And you've got to fit the hinge piece on the bottom. And again, you come along and they say, put that flat, and this has to be 26 thousandths of an inch above there. That took a bit of thinking. So what I did eventually was got a piece of aluminium that was actually 28 thou, filed a bit down, fitted it on there, pushed it down, and there's another little idea that I've shared with a few other people. That was a mystery, the bottom of the rudder. Three, three uh, view drawing just confused the hell out of me. And again, back onto the internet to work out how you're going to fit that thing in there. It actually came out very nicely in the end. So there it is there. Now at this stage, folks, I'm really patting myself on the back. I'm a clever bloke. I've made this. I haven't made any mistakes. Well, not many anyway. And I'm doing really well. Where's the problem? Right up the top there is where that plastic piece there, the fiberglass tip's going to go. In the early days, that was an option. So I built it as though I'm not going to put a fiberglass tip on it. When I turn the page and it says, for fiberglass, for optional fiberglass tip, allow three thirty seconds of an inch all the way around the little top former. It's all very bloody well telling you now. So there I de-riveted the, the little top former, threw that away, ordered another one, and um, away we went. Easy to make them up. <coughs> the glasses, perspiring freely in the middle of the summer of uh, 2012, I took these off and shook them to get the moisture out of them. <laughs> so that was probably uh, one of the victims. The horizontal stab, which just sits underneath that, similar sort of deal. There's all the bits and pieces. You've got to get these things in the right place, measure them precisely and drill them in place. It, it really does work quite nicely, but you kind of feel the pressure because every single one of those bits are moderately expensive. And again, it, it's the old story of you, you measure it, put it out, mark it out, pick up the drill, think about it for a while, put down the drill, pick up the ruler, measure it again, pick up the drill, think about it, put it down. At some stage you've got to man up and drill that hole, but it does take a little bit of doing. So you can see that's the bottom end of those Clecos just holding it into place. Eventually we built that, put the skin on, riveted the skin in place, and then looked at it and I saw a variation of two and a half millimetres, a little under an eighth of an inch. I'm told now that that wasn't a bad standard, but I looked at it and didn't like it. So that all came apart. You can see rib 3 US, rib 2 US, rib 1 US, tip rib US, on it went. However, I went back together, now there's half a millimetre of error, and I'm happy. Again, there's the little piece right at the end. 
just down here, and that was also fitted in as though we weren't going to put a plastic tip on. I might add, all at the same time. So I ordered one for that end, one for the other end, one for the rudder. Sonics are quite used to this. <laughs> and at long last, there it is, the finished product, ready to take the elevators. There's the tips put on it. Okay, they are incidentally exactly the same as the others. There's the elevator. How could you possibly muck that up? Not hard, not hard at all. There's a line there that says, to the fuselage. See that right there? That's where some really dumb bugger drilled on the wrong side of the line with his cutter. Colin Morrow looked at it and said, you know, you could repair it. And I said, yeah. And he said, but you'll always be able to see it. And you'll always hate it. Toughen up, Princess. Go buy yourself another one. So I did. And again, that was done. Oh, that caused a moment's great <laughs> angst. When I saw this, it's well off to one side. Had me running back to the plans. It's supposed to be well off to one side. Eventually, there it is, all tucked in nicely, beautifully riveted, and it worked very, very well. Another one of the little moments we had we had, I had, and uh, that's the new part that turned up to replace that little error. There was the final exercise right there, and gradually get used to trying to work out how you're going to get all these, play, all these parts in the exact right place to rip them together. But yeah, it's worked. There's the bits, finally, where it was at the stage that I could say, good, they're finished, we'll pop them in the shed, all done. So we start the wings. If confession is good for the soul, this is how you can make an error. Up here, there was a couple of holes to be drilled. Came out to a certain depth of the line, you put a hole in there, that was for the aileron rod. Put the hole on the wrong side of the line, didn't I, for the first one. Murray and I had been through this together. We'd measured it because different angle there and there, right and left hand side, this one sat on the top, that one sat on the bottom. There are all sorts of differences. We patted ourselves on the back and said, man, what a challenge that was. Didn't we do that well? Next morning, I sent him a text that said, I've had an oar, shucks, Martin. And I've fouled it all up. So I had to buy a new piece of this. Now, if you go to the US and buy a piece of that, you know, you'll have to bring the house papers to pay for the freight. So I talked to a couple of the guys down here, and they said, no, 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 go and talk to Gary over in Maddington. He's got this u bending plan. This is exactly eight feet long. I like telling this story because somebody else mucked up, not me. So I've taken this material out to Gary and said, here it is, mate. Here's a sample. This is what you've got to make. This is eight feet long, this piece of material, and it's got to be eight feet. He said, no problem, Dicko. He said, I'll give it to the kid. He's pretty good, and he needs a bit of practice on this. Yeah, done. A couple of days later, come out and get him. Beauty. He said, how many you want? He said, I can do one, I can do two, just as easy, because once you've set it up. He said, do two. No faith in myself at all. So anyway, I get two. Beautiful. The angles were perfect. Everything was spot on. Except, when I took them home, put them on the bench, and measured them out, they're about 33 and a half millimetres short. So I rang up Gary and I said, mate, bloody magnificent job, but they're short. No, nah, can't be, Dick. He said, they're eight feet long. And I said, they're bloody not. And he said, what are they? And I said, about seven foot ten and a half. And he said, hell, what? why would you have done that? <laughs> why indeed? How long is a foot? Ask anybody, 300 millimetres. 
<laughs> Three eighths of 24, 2.4 metres long. That's how long they were. Trouble is, it's not, is it? 25.4 millimetres in an inch. When you add it up, it's guess what? 32 and a bit millimetres short. So anyway, I dropped those back to Gary and he made some more for me, which is very nice, didn't charge me, and uh, it all worked out. And I did say I was really pleased that he didn't cut the material to 2400 millimetres, so he didn't. But yeah, that was one that I mucked something up and Gary apologised and said, mate, you make me feel good, at least somebody else is buggering things up. <laughs> so they were the rear spars, very, very light. There's the ends, kind of different. That's one of the wing ribs. Murray doing a, a very scientific task of putting the ribs on the main spar. One of the really nice things, both the ribs and the main spar were pre-drilled. Kind of tough to get that one wrong. There we were, all set up on the right hand wing. Gradually it went on, a few little mods to make on the ribs as they went out. You can see the rear spar is there. By now, my spouse is starting to realise that this actually might be a prospect. You know, it might actually be um, an aeroplane when finished. Uh, there hasn't been any volunteer stories from her about coming for a ride, but I'm really flattered by the number of people who've said to me, yeah, no, count me and I'll be in that. So that's nice. There's some little bushes right there, little oil bushes that you've got to pre-oil them and put them in place and they're a beautiful fit until you press them in place and then I went on the net and it said get yourself a reamer and ream them to size <laughs> so back I went to good old Carlisle Tech thank you government and borrowed a reamer and reamed them out to size I know what you do if you haven't got a Carlisle Tech handy <laughs> there's all the bits and pieces for the two sides for those aileron brackets. There it is installed on the, on the rib. So that is the aileron bracket there. I did make a little change. Down here, a good friend of mine said, mate, long after you're gone, if this thing still lasts that long, somebody might want to replace those bushes up there. You should put some nuts and bolts in there instead. And this gentleman, my mate, Mr. Hanley, I have a fair amount of respect for him. So I said, yeah, all right. So off I went over the road here, got some little AN quality hardware. And instead of riveting that in, it's bolted in. You still have to be, you know, somebody who's quite comfortable working on minis and things like that to get your mitt in there to undo it. But at least you could get it out. That sort of side goods, I apologise for that. But that shows the aileron bracket there. The rod ends aren't in place, but that's where the rod ends will go. They're the control rods for the system. <coughs> um, these parts here are just reinforcement that go on the wing skin. Here's those four bolts that I was talking about, Murray. Yeah. That one, that one, and that one. We fitted this. There's four, there's four rivets missing. And we've had a few occasions when we've been stumped and I've written to Sonex in the form of an email and they send you back a very polite little note that basically says RTFP, read the flippin' plans. <laughs> um, well, we scratched around with the, not this wing but the other wing because these rivets were all in there. And I said, help me out here. The other wing had four rivets missing. And the guy came back and said, yeah, sometimes our riveter gets carried away. Just drill them out, Richard, you'll be fine. So I thought, yay, one for the good guys. So we got that one right. That's the tie-down that just bolts into place, and there's a little tie-down fitting underneath that. Okay, so there was the wing ready to go. Just showing the other view, and it was now ready to fit the skins. Step one, and they really hammer this down to you, you must get the wing nice and level. Thank you, John. The table's just beautiful. So that was good. The, the skin comes in three pieces. Two flat pieces that just sit in place and one nose piece. Now, I'm really, really sorry that my mate Harry O'Neill is not here. He's <laughs> elsewhere. 
because I brought the pedostatic mask with me. I made the mistake of bringing this two weeks in a row just to show off a little mod that I had done because the factory said, put four washers there. I thought, four washers? What a bloody horrible looking thing that is. So again, on a visit out Carlisle Tech with a bit of round aluminium, I said, hey Freddie, just cut me off four little quarter inch pieces, will you? So there's mine. Much, much nicer than the factory's one, without the four washers, but with four neat little spaces, and it probably weighs a couple of ounces less. There's the wing as it stands. So it really is, you can see it now, it's riveted all the way along the main spar there. And all of these holes, are, the pilot holes, are in the skin. You line them all up, you've got to do a bit of pushing and pulling with the ribs to get them exactly centre, and then you drill and it's done. So the progress to date is, we have two wings now that look like that. We've got a couple little things to, to finish off there, then some control surfaces to make. Hopefully I'll remember to cut it on the right side of the line this time, and away you go. So, in wrapping up, what's involved? Folks, you've got to be reasonably organised. You've got to have some sort of room to work. You have to want to do it. If you wanted to build an aeroplane just because you wanted a cheap aeroplane, I just get the feeling it would be really, really hard work. Can anybody do it? Sensitive question. Talk to these folks and they will say yes. My thought is, the kind of background I had with my automotive training and, and my automotive career, armed me fairly well. The sort of training that I worked through TAFE, particularly with respect to a good grasp of measuring, both imperial and metric, also served me well. I have a friend of mine who's building one, and I don't think he's got quite the same grasp of the measuring, and I know there will be quite a few phone calls exchanged between he and I. If you can't stand to be wrong, if you've got an ego that just hates not being the man who knows bloody everything, don't do it. It'll kill you. <laughs> Flying Magazine said in an article, so you want to build an aeroplane, they said, look, if you're the kind of person who can look at something you've just done walk over pounding your head against your fists and saying, how could I be such a bloody idiot? And then go to bed hating yourself and then get up tomorrow morning and say, right, oh, well, how will we fix that? You're probably in there with a chance. But if you really, really hate to make a mistake, this is not for you. As Flying said, the next aeroplane that is built without any of these oh my gosh moments will be the first one. <laughs> if you're happy to learn lots of new stuff, if you have a good friend to build with, you often need second brains as well as a second pair of hands, and even then, it still sometimes goes wrong. If you're happy, or at least not too miserable if you stuff something up, I think it's great fun. Thanks, folks.